All right, rock and roll. Andrew, back once again. Uh, thank God, because I get bored of doing these on my own. But before we actually get into it, that is the dialectic of sex. What's the subtitle called? Uh, the case for feminist revolution. The case for feminist revolution. Andrew, what do you do? Andrew, what do you do? Why what do, do you I do? do? What do you do? Uh, I'm a PhD uh, candidate at the Center for... Uh, theory and criticism, which means that I uh, spend an unhealthy portion of my life sitting down reading books um, and uh, either and or theorizing and criticizing about them. Um, and uh, my interests sort of vary from conspiracy theories, as we were talking about earlier, uh, right wing um, movements. Um, uh, post-Marxist um, ideologies and sort of revolutionary groups and um, intellectual history. Um, so that's largely my background as I c conceive of it spontaneously right now. Um, <laughs> but uh, do, uh, do, 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 also what I like to do is um, buy a, a whole bunch of um, books um, that I uh, rarely get around to reading um, uh, more than once. And so um, I get you to read uh, the books that I want to read twice. <laughs> and I come <laughs> to you for a reason. I'll hold uh, to your study to uh, 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 discuss them with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, I guess that's a good reason. And you give me reasons to read things that maybe otherwise I wouldn't have not only not read, but probably wouldn't have even heard of. Yeah. This, this being one example. But more than that, you do writings. You write for magazines. Yes. So you should mention that a bit. Well, I, 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 I put your links up in here. No, that would, uh, I'd appreciate that a, a good deal. I mean, I've, as I said, I do write about, uh, uh, mainly on conspiracy theories and uh, the radical right. So uh, two of my recent pieces, uh, one came out in Commune. It's called The American Roots of a Right-Wing Conspiracy Theory. It's about... Uh, uh, Lyndon LaRouche and um, the cultural Marxism uh, myth and uh, the one after that is about a book uh, called uh, Revolution from Above by New Zealand conspiracy theorist uh, Kerry Bolton who um, talks about how uh, uh, evil European philosophers brought um, uh, critical theory to uh, America through the new school uh, and, and that's out on public seminar which is like the online magazine for uh, the, the new school so as you can tell I'm very much uh, a member of the uh, new world order <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm here to make sure that it stays oh yeah me too I get my uh, Illuminati hood next week okay well that's wonderful uh, they didn't they aren't going to dry clean it for me though well, it, 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 it's it's uh, tumble dry only, so... <laughs> my, my dryer does that, thank God. Yeah, goodness. So, as for today, we have the dialectic of sex. So this is... How do you pronounce the name? Shulamath? Uh, Sh Shulamath Firestone. I, I, I've... Um, I mean, admittedly, you should learn how to uh, pronounce the, the the name of the person you're discussing on the podcast. Yeah. But I, I, I usually say Shalema Firestone, or just refer to her as as Firestone. Yeah, Firestone um, is a lot better. I, well, it's a very cool surname. I would sell my soul for that surname. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's it's very rock and roll. Yeah, yeah uh, well, certainly. So she wrote this. This is from 1970. She was 1970. 20, 25. When she wrote it, twenty four, twenty five, I think. Indeed, uh, I'm a member of the, uh, I mean, sort of various radical feminist groups in New York at the time. So, feminism. It's, yeah, it's, it, it's a response to why well, the, the book emerges from her experience in those mo in the women's liberation movement at the time, um, and can sort of be described as. Um, a critique of certain elements within the women's right movement and um, the proposal for a, a kind of a, a f feminist uh, socialism, a, a feminist socialist future. Um, 
So it's it's sort of one of the key texts of you know what gets described as sort of radical feminism. You get um, other people like uh, 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 Mary Daly and Jermaine Greer who were part of this sort of same uh, era and uh, had a similar uh, ethos to uh, Firestone. Uh, but Firestone is. Um, Excuse the, the, the train. Yeah, oh, That's the train. It's the one out of all of them that uh, has. Uh, whose book has sort of been returned to in uh, theory and philosoph- philosophical circles, especially among like the xenofeminists feminists like uh, Helen Hester and uh, also uh, Sophie Lewis, whose book, uh, Full Surrogacy Now, is like. Um, uh, almost like a uh, an updated version of the dialectic of se- some of the arguments put forward in the dialectic of sex. So when she framed, just from the title alone, when we're dealing with a thing called the dialectic, one might think that obviously she's going to have some kind of Marxist leanings. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what is it for you? I have my own answer to this, but how does she <clears throat> distance herself from that movement proper? From... Marxism, as it has been traditionally understood. So she makes reference to Marx, of course, and Engels a little bit more specifically, mm-hmm. who gives her some more motivation to think mm-hmm. of something different. What does that look like for you? Well, one of her main uh, arguments in the book is that uh, uh, sexual difference has hitherto not been uh, analysed as a, a class difference. Um, so she has this category of the uh, sex class and how um, a woman's bondage essentially to uh, biological reproduction has uh, led to their uh, confinement within uh, the class uh, category of of womanhood and uh, motherhood and all that entails with like the uh, family obligations and uh, responsibilities and uh, from this sort of very basic uh, division between like uh, of, of reproductive processes between the male and the female this has been you know, crystallized into cultural forms um, that have, you know, that has split society into you know uh, uh, different classes and supported different uh, uh, social structures. So um, later in the book, she discusses like uh, uh, the division of male and female into the technological mode and the aesthetic mode and. Um, how uh, uh, culture and society at large has been driven towards this uh, process of trying to realise the conceivable in the actual. And because of the uh, dialectic of sex splitting um, the male and female into like uh, separate categories, it means that there isn't a uh, overarching sublation uh, of the dialectic in which the categories of male and female of technological anesthetic um, are um, annihilated and overcome towards like um, well uh, for Firestone uh, feminist socialism or just like uh, in a more simple term the answer to the question what comes next um, so she thinks as, uh, as long as this uh, sort of dialectic of sex uh, continues between like um the male and the female, there won't be this um, uh, socialist uh, utopia. I don't mean that in a, a dismissive sense. I mean, I, 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 I think she perceives um, an absence of like gender analysis in the um, Marxist socialist project that um, is, is kind of beneficial to consider. Um, that that. Well, no, the, 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 uh, let me just go off on a, a small digression uh, about how, in like, some Marxist theoretical circles, talk about how 
what we need to do is return to a, a proper economic class analysis, ra analysis rather than wasting our time with um, identity politics. What Firestone lays out in this book uh, is that um, identity is a, a class uh, concept. Um, which means that, uh, we, we, that this sort of dichotomy that uh, uh, gets set up by some uh, relatively vulgar Marxist theoreticians um, remains trapped within the dialectic of sex without a resolution. Yeah, and she goes so far as to even say that class distinction has its it has its genesis within the division of sexuality, like. Mm -hmm. You know, not just looking toward the future, but looking toward the past as well. Mm -hmm. Seeing these things actually having been uh, erected because of the subjugation of women uh, in relation to men and by men uh, and what should be done about that. Mm -hmm. And so more than just the Marxist, she takes or suggests that people like Beauvoir also participate in this kind of othering right. of women, uh, suggesting that she maintains a, the idea of a kind of Hegelian other that participates in this this maintaining this kind of dialectical framework uh, and we could think th think of this going on you know many years after with people like judith butler mm -hmm. thinking about things in terms of i guess this kind of dialectical framework or maintaining the necessity of there being an other or there having to be another mm -hmm. in order to constitute you know a self or to, you know yeah oneself uh which for her and that's why i think that for my own part, this was really, what she was doing was really revolutionary because it was really trying to think of the ways in which all those people claiming to be these so-called revolutionary thinkers were in many ways, you know, replicating the exact same things mm -hmm. that they were purporting to, you know, to challenge. Well, not only the revolutionary thinkers, but the revolutionaries themselves. Yeah. Which she gets into with yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, the, the critique of... Uh, uh, certain strains of the women's rights movement and the women liberation movement and also um, the uh, radical left movements uh, of her time um, how uh, the uh, sex class issue was seen as auxiliary to revolutionary struggle rather than uh, a fundamental part of it yeah yeah exactly and it it makes so much sense like and maybe that's just because you know now being somewhat versed in these issues um women make up more than half of the population yet you know when you consider how much power wealth authority they have it's like nothing there's, there's nothing so relatively that is so it begs some pretty fundamental questions about well, you know what is going on here like it seems as though one side of this equation is getting the short end of the stick and that could hardly be reduced to you know natural mm -hmm. things right which is also i think one of the things that makes her critique so interesting especially when taking on the kind of biological assumptions about men and women and and we see this this kind of thing as well in simone de beauvoir when you know she i don't know if, if you know but she she has this long kind of uh, scientific critique of the that argument that you know men are just superior to women because of like brain sizes mm -hmm. and then she goes on to totally debunk that because mm -hmm. if we follow that that logic one that's actually that still floats around various you know online circles mm -hmm. does that mean that shorter people are you know less intelligent than taller people like there, there's no uh, logic to that or it, it doesn't follow through very well uh, but she gives us a very interesting template to really get at the foundations of all of these assumptions that people were taking for granted at the time and even today, mm. I think. Most certainly. And, I mean, I hesitate to talk about how she... Um, well, I mean, the, the, the category of the natural is, like, very... Um, a uh, complicated thing to unpack, but she do, she, she does see her moment in time as this um, point at which women can be liberated from their uh, biology, and the resistance to that. I mean, she she talks about it in relation to childhood, but it can be well about, about the relationship between uh, uh, childhood and the subjugation of woman. Um, 
where she talks about how a, a physical difference has been enlarged culturally with the help of special dress, education, manners, and activity, until this cultural reinforcement itself began to appear natural, even instinctive, an exaggeration process that enables uh, easy uh, stereotyping. So there is this um, argument in the book about how the natural is you know, uh, uh, fabricated and uh, uh, reinforced and perpetuated um, largely to um, support uh, the, the class uh, structure that you were describing about how there is the, uh, one half of the population with um, a disproportionate amount of power and influence uh, particularly over the um, other half of the population that uh, uh, tends to lack it. And the, uh, and the justifications for them are based on this aspect, on this sense of the natural that is um, really um, quite contingent, but uh, also very contagious at the same time. Um. So, but reading this, uh, I feel like someone could also fall into a certain trap reading it because when she's saying, and she's lays this out right from the beginning that she feels one of the impediments to women's progress is their, you know, their biological makeup, like their ability to give birth and all this. Whereas she's saying, you know what, even the way that we have a relationship to this thing is which we then come to call natural, like as though mm. childbirth and then child rearing are natural things, uh, is are not themselves natural. Mm. So she is very careful not to um, conflate the two to suggest like there is a universal mm -hmm. um, or attaching to the biological uh, possibilities of women in, mm -hmm. you know, quotes, uh, attaching to that a kind of, universal or natural quality, but rather suggesting that the way in which it is viewed by society at large, especially in those, you know, patriarchal uh, capitalist ones that see that body as being something that is, you know, manipulable, mm -hmm. something that can be used for the system, and that therefore the best way to mobilize that is to sell it as being natural, saying, mm -hmm. look, women can do this, therefore they should do this. Mm -hmm. Women can, you know, serve x y and z functions and therefore it's a universal thing whereas she's really at least the impression i get is her just trying to totally overhaul from the foundations mm -hmm. just fundamental assumptions about naturality which you know the postmodern neo-marxist yeah. you know bulbs or, or, or sirens are now ringing like ah uh, who is this crazy person back yeah. in 1970 before the Gulag Archipelago was released, who is this person? Um, but yeah, just this is certainly one of the things I saw really interesting about this text because it's not really an argument I'd seen before, especially how it relates to um, the technological side of things or her argument that you know technology can emancipate women from their own mm -hmm. biologies. Because those biologies weren't always there. No. Those biologies were imposed upon them by various mechanisms mm -hmm. of, I will say, power. But you could be more specific with class or with mm -hmm. anything else that makes these things natural. And that, therefore, through their becoming natural, you know, makes it mandatory. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's similar to, like, uh, the... Well, yeah, I mean, if you, if you, if you, uh, human beings are not natural creatures uh, at all. I mean, you you you, you can like uh, uh, measure this with like the the concept of uh, like uh, life expectancy. Like there are there have been ways that sort of culture has been able to respond to natural phenomenon uh, in ways to like a. Uh, thwart it or uh, uh, divert it or, or prevent it that have enabled us to uh, b build uh, societies and the cultures in the same way that we have and she talks about how the family um, was a 
uh, a cultural form that emerged from an era in which women were more like subservient to their to, to a prescribed idea of like their biological or reproductive function um, and also how uh, um, uh, childhood got wrapped up into that and there was a sense of uh, a physical dependency of both the woman and the child on on the male and one of her arguments about the sort of uh, the ways that technology can emancipate women from their um, previous position of subjugation is that it is this cultural or technological um, response to the trials of like a, a, a biological existence so There, there is this sense in which like um, the cultural forms that were uh, produced in response to like a particular way that a particular mode of reproduction um, as in like the, uh, the family the, the patriarch was a person who would uh, earn the money or uh, uh, go out and like uh, provide sustenance for everyone else. The, uh, the the woman stayed at home to reproduce and um, or, or also like uh, provide nourishment for the child and for the the, the father and the 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 way that the, the, the child was perceived as the property of the um, the, the, the the patriarch um, is no longer a um, adequate or appropriate. Uh, uh, form for relating to one another uh, in the face of these new technological advancements like uh, the pill and uh, automation and other forms of like uh, reproductive control that means that we have a more like a conscious grasp over seemingly natural or biological processes I don't, I don't, this comes much later in like a, a, a chapter on feminism and ecology uh, and, 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 and she's writing in like the early 1970s where uh, ideas like the population bomb were very popular about how overpopulation would uh, 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 create a um, uh, how over how humans would become so well, let me think about how to phrase this how the planet would become so overpopulated that we wouldn't be able to find the adequate resources right, to I support support the number of humans living on the planet um, and so Firestone perceives this as like us uh, failing a inverted commas like natural balance but the task now is for us to find uh, a conscious artificial balance that um, is able to overcome the sex class system yeah uh, and I remember from when reading it that uh, she gave specifically writing this in 1969, 1970. She said that she was she was quoting scientists that were saying yeah. that in 40 years, like you know, the United States is going to reach its threshold. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. oh shit! <laughs> I wonder what what you know. We're already past. Maybe it has. I don't know. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> it. Maybe we're already beyond it. Yeah. Um, but she okay. So she was positioning herself in contradistinction to a number of other groups. So really Hi. broadly, you know, there were the conservative feminists, mm -hmm. there were the and the and the reformist feminists. Mm -hmm. That so you had the conservative conservative feminists that obviously she had no affinity with. Hi. Then there were the liberal feminists who were on the more reformist side, right? Who would Hi. you know, <clears throat> I guess champion women's rights, but would also always do so through like the man's voice mm -hmm. or through through the patriarchal institutions and structures that were already you know, built for their favor. So she would ask, you know, how much change can you actually enact through these institutions? But then she's, you know, positioning herself in this really radical position, which is also a little bit ironic because she's, you know, saying that we need the developments of this system to get us out of this system. Mm -hmm. Like she, she draws the line at, you know, engaging in, uh, I guess, the political me measures or the political means that the liberal feminists or reformist feminists were, but she's really wants to 
mobilize the kind of scientific developments that were very patriarchal, even at the, at the time, mm-hmm. obviously. Um, kind of seeing them as a way out, which I thought was interesting that she created that bifurcation or saw a distinction between these two types of, um, I guess, emancipatory strategies that I was... I, she didn't at any point bring that up or, or question, like, how does this technology maybe not get us to where we need to go? Or I didn't find it was really sifted out as much as it could have been. So I was curious what you know what you thought about that, if maybe she should have paid more credence to that, like how those technologies were, you know, part of this system, how they replicated that problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I do agree. I, I, I have a, a sense that um, the stuff like the, the pill um, was have a, a seen with uh, much more like a revolutionary potential uh, than uh, we can see of it now. Uh, but I think that's always been like the strange uh, irony in any kind of Marxist analysis. Like you think about the Communist Manifesto, where Marx and Engels are like praising the. Um, developments of industrialism and bourgeois society um, so there is always like uh, this aspect of like uh, Marxist revolutionary rhetoric that is trying to use the tools of the current society to produce a future one um, and there is one argument to be uh, made that you could make through like a an Arendtian lens or an Illich lens, just to use like the two people we've discussed yeah. before. Of <laughs> go, how, ch- go check out those videos. Exactly. How, how um, uh, th- 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 at least technologies are uh, always wedded to the system from which they are uh, created or like uh, uh, used. Uh, but for Firestone, she, 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 she says, I think uh, uh, later on in the book, that we shouldn't judge technologies by the way that they're used under the current system. We should try to imagine how they could be used under, like, uh, 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 under alternative like soci- arrangements of society, I guess. Yeah, and that that does really, you know, harken back to Marx, obviously, because yeah. uh, you know Marx is saying that you know one of the prerequisites for kind of socialist revolution or, or arriving at socialism or communism is having, a you know, an educated population. Mm-hmm. So, but how do they get educated? Obviously, they have to use the means that, you know, were available mm-hmm. to them. That is using the system against the system mm-hmm. or using what the system offers them mm-hmm. against the very system, um, which is, I guess, you know, we're forced to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, those marginalized communities can't just you know float outside of the the system in which they're living and then you know exact some kind of change over it from some kind of like transcendent principle because that's that's also pretty problematic to to assume that and if that was to try to be enacted like imagine the chaos yeah yeah (laughs) the world would crumble yeah i mean certainly i mean it would be uh, uh, uh pretty dramatic um what did you think about her um, concept of the uh, the fifty year ridicule of the the perceived gap between like the uh, fight for suffrage and the uh, the later woman's liberation movement? Right, because uh, she was saying that if I remember correctly, that the the suffrage movement, although good for her, was like you know, a kind of pressure valve. It's like, fine, we'll give women this, Indeed. and then, you know, they're, they'll be fine. Uh, but then what followed, right, was... What followed was not just, like, ridicule, and I think that she really hits the nail on the head. Like, people were, uh, especially coming up against, you know, Thatcher and, and Reaganism, um, having people go to these kind of ultra-individualistic or, you know, neoliberal-type doctrines, it really made a mockery of the whole feminist movement because suddenly after this movement had occurred you there were all these women that were you know just living in the home essentially kind of i guess making people think uh 
And of course, it isn't their fault, but people thinking to that, well, what a what a revolution that was, you know? We, <laughs> you did a great job, and now you're here doing this. What you should be doing, like, good, yeah. really good. Uh, but aside from that, I didn't give that part a whole lot of thought. Well, I, th- I think it's. I mean, for, for me, what's striking about it is how there are uh, moments of like uh, almost uh, 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 there are moments of like political tension and conflict that threaten to almost obliterate the, uh, the way that society and culture is is structured and there are then reactionary um, uh, I always use the word movement in that sense uh, re- reactionary like um, impulses that are uh, um, asserted against it. So, like in the fifty year ridicule, uh, Firestone talks about like uh, uh, the twenties of like the, the, the flapper era and eroticism and style being used as uh, uh, tools of like perceived liberation that are diverting the energies of a woman who would uh, otherwise be part of like a, a, a more like. Uh, political liberation movement towards like mere like uh, self-directed ends, and uh, and how that sort of uh, 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 cultural tool of um, repression was um, uh, revised or uh, like uh, uh, redirected in later eras, and I I wonder whether something very similar happens to like a. Uh, the the moment of radical feminism in the late sixties and early seventies, how um, the it, 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 how I mean there were there are arguments made about how like the counterculture of the sixties and the seventies became uh, commodified and uh, uh, commercialized and um, and tamed and whether that's uh, something that um, obviously Firestone couldn't anticipate in her own track, or whether there's something about like uh, Firestone's radicality that sort of resists uh, being co-opted or like um, uh, undermined by like the, these cultural tools uh, that power uses to like uh, uh, immunize itself against uh, revolutionary currents. Right, and she did. She seemed tuned into that too, because when yeah. she's listing off all the you know women feminists that are remembered, right? Yeah. You know, she's, she's yeah, yeah, the goody goodies. The, yeah, 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 yeah exactly. The yeah. ones that that aren't too far, you know, aren't too radical. It's like yeah. you, you know, you're you're okay, you're okay. Like we see where you're coming from. That mm-hmm. that's fine. Um, so I think she was tuned into that, like Aye. that idea that you know you really, and I think she embodied it, like taking on a position that was so far outside of the dominant narrative that she was you know in co-optable co-optable yeah, yeah. Uh, and I like I don't know if it's true the system probably found ways like capitalism is particularly yeah. effective at taking whatever is antithetical to it and incorporating it inoculating mm-hmm. itself to some extent well I mean what, one of the arguments by the uh, I told you about the news report about like uh, feminist movements in New York that I watched earlier that had like a straw interview of uh, Firestone but one of the arguments uh, 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 made about the family is that um, under capitalism the family is crumbling anyway Um, and so uh, the radical abolition of the uh, uh, the radical abolition of uh, the family is um, actually like a a positive vision for the collapsing of the old society, I guess. Um, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's kind of a sort of uh, yeah, oh, a fascinating aspect. So, do, 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 uh, do you want to get to the uh, Freudian question? I would or? love to get to the Freudian okay, question. Yeah. So this would be popping us into chapter three now. Oh, indeed. Yeah, so. Yeah. 
Fro okay, so she has a kind of a tumultuous relationship with Freud and Freudianism psychoanalysis, um, suggesting that Freudianism and feminism have their, sa their, their I guess, their roots in the same soil. Mm -hmm. That is, they both have recognized fundamental problems presented by various patriarchal institutions like the family, like, you know, civilization and its discontents or, or anything else, or mm -hmm. the problems posed by contemporary forms of sexuality or incest or how sexuality should be conducted. But Firestone is pretty critical of the way that Freud approached these problems, suggesting that they were, or he didn't look at the way that they were part of a greater social phenomenon, and it seemed to her, at least how I understood it, but correct me if you have another interpretation, um, she saw in Freud a kind of limited analysis of something, tracing it to almost like a biological truism, as opposed to looking at it as being products of a social phenomena that have resulted in this framework that is the framework of the family the framework of the oedipus complex yada 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 and that these things do not exist outside of these contexts so one of the examples she gives and well it's not really an example but one of the ways that she kind of undoes the freudian argument is by saying that the oedipus complex can't really be found in other settings in other i guess epistemic frameworks where people don't live in nuclear family mm -hmm. settings in the way that they do in the quote-unquote West, the global North, or whatever term to specify that. Uh, and yeah, before I go on, Andrew. Well, yeah, the, as she says in the book, uh, uh, Freud was merely a, diagnosti a diagnostician for what feminism purports to cure. Yeah, there you um, go. Yeah, exactly. And she senses the um, reactionary elements or uh, uses of uh, a Freudian clinical psychology of like merely operating to get people adjusted to their forms of oppression either that oh gosh sorry uh, either that's sort of uh, uh, lingering from their childhood or, or that's existing in this sort of daily discontent within their marriages and how especially uh, clinical psychology developed in um, America as another one of those uh, pressure valves so that if it's, it's to allow people to let off steam or like uh, find quote unquote fulfillment but even um, in that way like uh, as Firestone says it wasn't successful like I can't I don't have the stats in front of me but she was for only like 40% of participants or something oh yeah. 40 45 or, or something uh, would psychoanalysis prove to be like an effective um, you know, strategy. Mm -hmm. And with such a small percentage, you know, you, you'd ask, like, how much of that is the placebo effect? Like, someone telling yeah. you this is going to work, and then, you know, you you making it work because of that. Uh, but yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean... Uh, yeah, no, I mean... There are many... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, jokes about how uh, um, uh, Freudianism operated in America. And I, I can't think of any uh, uh, jokes that weren't by um, uh, Woody Allen. But like there's a Woody Allen joke about going to see a psychoanalyst as analyst and like a, how uh, the psychoanalyst was a strict Freudian and they make you pay for the sessions you miss. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it is like a, a, a bit of a like a uh, a commercial racket, but it, it is seen as um, a cure that uh, works if you if you even don't go to it. Um, but it's uh, no. I mean, it's, 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 uh, that's a whole a whole other issue in itself. But the oh, many parts of the book, I guess are uh, dis discussing um, inadequate cures for the problems that inevitably arise from the sex class system. Right. So but Freudianism is one. Um, uh, romanticism is another. 
Um, eroticism could also like sort of be subsumed under um, a lap label, but they are attempts to you know quell the discontents that are produced by a particular way of like arranging relationships. I think maybe. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's one of the things she says that. Uh, Freudianism technically has in line with uh, feminism because they they are identifying the same problem areas, right? As yeah. I said before. Aye. So you know, Firestone says provocatively, and she's she's funny too. She's like, okay, well, as Freud tells us, the family is like the source of this kind of repression. Uh, as just one one place, like she's like, let's do away with it. Aye. To which all the other people are like, no, 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 that's too far. That's too Aye. far. But you know, she she makes the case that while feminism and Freudianism are, in many respects, identifying the same problems, for some reason, Freudianism is kind of an accepted phenomenon. It's it's taken up by the social paradigm as being um, kind of an accepted way to go about dealing with the world, whereas feminism was looking was being looked at as some kind of like, you know, crazy shit like. You're a feminist. Well, that's because Freudianism didn't want to change. The, well, that's exactly uh, the it. System because it's like, well, I mean, where are all my patients going to come from if we change the uh, whole root of the problem? Right. Exactly. It, yeah. Exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, it. I mean, that's I mean, it. We did away with Freud. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, uh, yeah, indeed. But I don't. Yeah, I, but I mean, what? what uh, I mean, we'll, 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 we'll touch on it later. But like, for uh, the, the Oedipus complex then becomes a kind of heuristic for uh, Firestone throughout the uh, following two chapters. Right. Um, and. You do wonder that if you uh, kind of reject uh, Freudianism, Freud, uh, Freudian analysis of the problem, which provides the theory that motivates the idea of the cure, if you use Freudian analysis to um, investigate or problematize or try and critique the institutions of childhood and like institutionalized racism then does the the cure or the solution to those problems remain limited to that Freudian analysis or is it possible to uh, propose a different cure without departing from the Freudian analysis of those problems yeah, I mean that's that's a massive question, yeah. and um, it would probably take a good two hundred and fifty pages. Well, yeah. we, 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 it would take to, to take a good time to try and figure out whether Firestone does that with like virtuosic success or not. I mean, it's essentially what she sets out to do, but uh, and she does it. I mean. She obviously lays out an uh, interesting like, uh, proposal for an alternative society in the end of the book, but you wonder whether her analysis of, of her childhood and especially race is, you know, through a Freudian lens, is sufficient. Yeah, but it seems like while I might, and we'll get into this, but while I might not totally agree, I think that she's being fairly consistent where she says that psychoanalysis is yeah. a thing that has taken over. Psychoanalysis has had an indelible effect or has left an indelible mark on society at large. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it makes sense that you know we adopt the same kind of rhetoric to mm -hmm. oppose it, just like she says that we can take science. Okay. Take science to... Um, Oppose the very system that births birth science. So why, like you're right. Like how could we, you know, to um, untangle some of the complexities of that, I guess theoretical strategy. 
uh, would be difficult. Mm-hmm. You know, before you know, before actually doing that, we'll we'll save that for another day. Uh, what the hell is childhood? Why does childhood matter to her? Um, because I mean, on one level, it is like um, a core component of like the Oedipus complex and uh, power relations in itself, but it's. Under the sex class system, there's a special relationship between the mother and the child against the uh, uh, the patriarch. So they, both the child and the the woman or the wife or the mother, um, whatever role is prescribed to a particular subject, um, they have a kind of special relationship. Uh, early on because both of them are not uh, permitted to participate in the uh, masculine adult world um, and in like the, the chapter of down with childhood she explores how the whole concept of childhood um, it, it is pretty artificial and didn't really exist until the 17th century in the modern sense, uh, because in the medieval era, um, ch- children were perceived as like a, just small adults, and this led to like sort of institutions like uh, apprenticeships, which admittedly were only um, available to uh, men for uh, uh, trades. Um, so, so it sort of retains. Uh, element of patriarchy but there is not an idea of childhood in the sense of the patriarchal nuclear family that we have in sort of uh, modern society so she sees this uh, idea of childhood as this uh, compulsory period in a person's life that leads them into assimilation into the sex class system either as as a man um, who then becomes uh, who as a child becomes more distant from his mother uh, to participate in like the, the joys of patriarchy with his father or as uh, as a girl who uh, recognises her, her mother's position of uh, oppression within the system tries to side with the father and then gets excluded from the uh, system as they grow older and um, there are two or three things that I'd like to add to this. Um, a whole critique of childhood is is wrapped up with a uh, Marxist class analysis of how childhood was a uh, bourgeois concept because bourgeois children were the only people in the society or uh, who are able to like uh, who, to be given the experience of childhood whereas uh, children from working class families at the time where this concept was being developed would have had to work would have had to uh, uh, be treated no different from their uh, parents or wouldn't have had the same relationship to their parents as the uh, bourgeois child would have had. So as this became like a uh, 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 more diffuse with like a, a certain spread of affluence throughout society, this just sort of became accepted as a sort of hegemonic norm, uh, which has led to like the I mean the, it's 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 odd how it sort of overlaps with how Firestone overlaps with Illich, but there is this critique of schooling. Uh, of instilling the uh, 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 virtue of discipline, uh, which for Firestone and also for Illich to a certain extent, teaches repression as a, a spiritual value. So uh, learning becomes uh, more um, other driven or approval conscious and. Uh, uh, eliminates or weakens the capacity for originality or creativity or intelligence or uh, ingenuity because it all becomes about integration and assimilation 
and uh, oppression. And there is this uh, parallel with the way that uh, Firestone describes the more reformist elements of the uh, feminist movement, of how they are trying to uh, integrate themselves within a uh, male uh, constructed uh, system rather than seeking to completely overturn or abolish that system itself. Yeah. Now I would, I would add to that discussion of schooling that uh, it slows development for... Um, yes, most certainly. Oh, yeah. Firestone. And this is something... And I was, I was happy to read this because this is something I've thought of myself uh, where it's, it's a ridiculous concept, right? And it certainly comes out in our... When we talk about Illich. But like, let's put a group of people that don't know the world in a room together yeah. and assume they're going to understand the world when they come out of it. Yeah. Like the, and they're going to stay together and grow, not being, you know, having a ratio now in Ontario, what, 1 to 40 it can be with the new government? Like, you can yeah. have 40 students in a class or something. Like, 40 people that don't know the world and have them sit together and assume they're going to learn about the world. Like, how, it, it's absurd. It's well, absurd. Well, one of the uh, perceptive remarks in Firestone's discussion of schooling and how is in is yeah it is how the uh, class itself or this division of classes by age means that younger children are detached from older children and so there isn't that kind of peer to peer shared knowledge yeah uh, but, but because there is this kind of stratification of uh, learning through age yeah um, and that's one of the like I mean I mean this is this is one of the I mean I, let me try and figure out my one of the fulfilling, fulfilling things about adulthood is that there is less of a sense of that stratification uh, between ages uh, because I'm, I mean I, I regularly talk to people who are you know, 35 and 52. We're in grad school, like, of course. Yeah, so, and, and this is much more uh, aligned to how uh, learning should probably take place. Yeah. Like, it, yeah, yeah. it doesn't matter how old you are, yeah. it, 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 what, what um, is required is uh, capacity for for sharing and opening up to um, others I think and she also has this other interesting insight that she's almost she hypothesizes that the creation of childhood one of the other reasons that it could have been was a way by which adults could romanticize the supposed oh, yeah. time that they weren't like exploited to which she says that that, that, that makes no sense because children are like being under constant surveillance they're groomed mm-hmm. in ways that you know, adult, as you just said, as like adults aren't, they they aren't this kind of role, like, you know, peaceful, free being that we let out in the yard and play. Okay. Like, and that's especially free not range children. Now. That's yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But uh, even at that time, I think it would have been better than now, where children are just like, you know, instead of anyone watching them, not to say anyone necessarily has to, but like, let's just put them in front of a television, and then, yeah. then they can become part of big data or something oh, yeah. and then be used for various marketing campaigns uh, and there you know, that's a whole other thing but what about sexuality this is what's going to get my channel banned oh what Ch- yeah, childhood the, sexuality you want to talk, yeah, yeah the yeah the 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 firestone pedophilia question yeah this is you can't be ignored we're gonna have a milo yiannopoulos moment here yeah exactly um I mean, I, 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 I spent. Well, I mean, the, 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 this sounds like peculiar, but I spent a lot of time thinking about this question, and one of her comments about how sexuality is repressed and constrained under the sex class system is that it becomes um, wholly centered on genital sex rather than the. Uh, uh, need or desire for intimacy being uh, 
expressed in a more polymorphous way that it isn't simply linked to the uh, sex act. So when she sort of discusses later in the book about like uh, 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 ch child sexuality, I think she's um, referring to it in more of a, um, uh, a polymorphous sense that uh, it doesn't make sense under our like uh, current uh, like arrangement of like sexual relations or intimate relations or all the sex class system because it, it, it simply wouldn't make sense at all um, and also uh, um, you wonder how much this enforced regime of like childhood uh, fucks with like levels of maturity and immaturity and uh, responsibility and consciousness of what uh, relationships with uh, other people mean. Like we were talking earlier about like uh, um, how uh, sex education in some cases is consci consciously like kept back from uh, uh, children or people who go to school. Uh, because of uh, like uh, various agendas, uh, but various agendas, um, and so it is possible to like conceive of like uh, inverted quotes, uh, child sexuality. Uh, well, both both those words should be in inverted quote of like child, what we would consider now to be a child, but in an alternative arrangement would. Uh, that distinction wouldn't hold as much and uh, sexuality in inverted commas of what sexuality might be in a more polymorphous sense might not be in the, in the same way it is now um, but on the topic of child sexuality and like the uh, assumed paedophilia within Firestone's argument it's only perceived as paedophilia in within like the sex class system and the way that sexuality is arranged along with that but it is like a very awkward and almost inappropriate thing to discuss before that that transition because like how would that how would that even work and maybe beyond a transition it wouldn't at all be appropriate or it would just be so, so, so unimaginable that we just couldn't figure out how to how it would work it, it is a like a I don't know I mean because she's trying to undo so many things in this book like once those things are undone then everything that has arranged our thinking up to now just doesn't hold anymore yeah um, but, 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 but if, if it is tricky like how do you imagine a, a, a society that's completely hanging into ours yeah. while li still living in the, the current society especially uh, on I mean she talks about like uh, how the abolition of the family would like um, uh, mean that we wouldn't have the incest taboo anymore right and yeah. like the, the reason that I mean it's unimaginable because it is still a taboo. Yeah. Um, and, and you just sort of can't think of beyond the taboo because it's the taboo is the unthinkable. Yeah. The, the, yes. This is what's given us a possibility to even think about it. Like yeah, yeah. It, it, it frames the way we understand it. But I like the distinction that you made or suggesting that this her discussion about child uh, sexuality, you know, didn't doesn't necessarily have to do with... Um, genitalia in any way but it could very well just be intimacy yeah, yeah where i think that you know that holds a lot of weight because you know instead of doing that we tell kids go play sports or go you know do this no, yeah, don't, and be, don't, don't touch yourself like the, the, don't you know, i mean that, that's a that's a part of the oedipus complex it's just like no you're not allowed to, uh, it, it, it's in the enforcement of pr prohibitions uh upon the child that then become you know uh, neuroses or uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, later in life, you know? <laughs> yeah, and we we actively, like, make them sublimate these kinds of feelings they might have. And ironically, you know, we 
put people into for people children to play sports where they can only play with people of their gender right. uh yet we frown upon homosexuality or right. completely erase right. that from the <laughs> from the uh curriculum as though it's it's really quite absurd but i think that all of these other institutions are like they are sublimations and they are ways that we and I'm just trying to understand Firestone, I think that she's tapping into um, a kind of natural thing with, with children, you know, and like anyone, like Freud, you know, you start being sexual at the age of zero. Um, as soon as you're born, you are a sexual being. Uh, and that in order to kind of curb these things, you know, then we put them into other ways. You know, we foster competition. We foster uh, other kinds of non intimacy that because intimacy poses i think a great threat at least i think firestone would think to the status quo because intimacy you know imagine children or anyone else just touching each other like Mm -hmm. just just well and there are various games various childhood games that do that like you think of bulldog you think of uh, right but these are acceptable those are acceptable ways uh of doing it because if it if it extends beyond that extends beyond a game where there's some kind mm-hmm. of um competition in play where there can be a winner and a loser then you know then it's not okay mm-hmm. if you're if you're doing these types of things outside of that setting then there's something wrong with you which is quite absurd uh and i think it really affirms what firestone is saying about you know the existence of this phenomenon that is sexuality not not just with children but with anyone else um yeah, you have any more on the children bit? Um, uh, the, the, the costume element was uh, fascinating. Oh, with uh, the, uh, well, with the, 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 the boys? history of the, the history of costume and of how um, until the age of maturity, boys would be forced to dress more like girls until yeah. they were allowed to uh, uh, dress like or a man. Military garb or, some, or something. I exactly. Think the term, yeah. um, and um, how costume really plays into like uh, gender presentation and um, I was telling someone about like the, the, the pockets phenomenon as well. Like, like a, women's clothes done in pockets. Yeah, yeah or, do, do, or inadequate pockets. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or fake pockets. Like they have the seams exactly, as though yeah. there's a pocket there. Yeah. But it's it's it's, 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 it's true just how like a uh, hard like uh, 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 wired this uh, sort of sexual uh, uh, division is kind of baked into like the way we think or the way that we like even make clothes. Um, <laughs> like it can, can it, the, the, the way that that signifier can come down to something so simple as like what you're wearing. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. Uh, so the, uh, racism, the sexism of the family for man section. Let's yeah. Before yeah, we will. That's where we're going to next. But we're going to pause this now. Okay. Now for a word from our sponsors, which is no one, because no one sponsors this shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe tune in for part two. It's c- coming right at you. How, how long we've we been chatting? Oh, okay, like an hour.